What is going on, everybody? Welcome back into TTP Sports at around 1.30 in the morning following this Flyers overtime loss against the Edmonton Oilers. They do get the loser point in this game, so they have three points in their first three games to start the season on this very, very tough way to start a season on a four-game West Coast road trip. So there is positives to take away from that, no doubt. I'm not going to harp on the team majorly at all. Uh, but this was definitely a missed opportunity to win this game, especially with the way you started out. Matt Vey Mitchkoff is here, and he has arrived. Two power play goals for him, getting his first two goals of his career. That was something very awesome to watch him tucking one in to where it needs to get reviewed to confirm the puck went over the line. And then Edmonton uses a challenge to make sure if it was goaltender interference or not. That doesn't get reversed. Edmonton takes another penalty because of that. The Flyers eventually score again on the power play because of a nice, you know, nifty little passing between Mitchkoff and Morgan Frost on the one-timer there for Mitchkoff's second goal. You got to find a way to win that game, man. You got to find a way to win that game, especially when your top guy, your top dude of the franchise for the foreseeable future, pots in his first two career goals. You got to find a way to finish that. You definitely do, especially with the way that Edmonton was just hand delivering you power plays. Edmonton was frustrated that entire first period. I believe you had four power plays in that first period. You had seven power plays the entire game. Now, like full disclosure here, the Flyers' power play does look 20 billion times better than it has been the past couple of years. So I really cannot ask that much of the power play to do what it's been doing so well in these first three games. They've scored a power play goal in every single game. That is probably more than anything they did in the past few years on their very abysmal power plays that they've had. So <laughs> I guess I'm asking for a little too much there, but when you do get seven power plays in your favor, you got to score maybe more than two. Maybe I'm asking for a little too much there, but, you know, it's just, you know, when Edmonton is getting frustrated, when you're forcing them to be frustrated and they're taking these stupid penalties, you got to make them pay for it. And I guess as the stages of the game went along, you didn't really make them pay for it. You had a good first period overall, 2 nothing lead. You basically just made Edmonton frustrated the entire time, especially with all the penalties they were taking in that first period. Then the second period kind of got out of hand. They end up tying the game. You have a couple defensive breakdowns, and it just started to get a little ugly. Edmonton started to get their juices flowing, and it was really their depth players. Adam Henrique scores off of a turnover when they keep the puck into the zone. And then just, you know, Connor Brown, same thing, off of a turnover. Scores, finds a way to get one past Arison. And really, there's no complaints about Arison tonight. I thought he was perfectly fine. He definitely made some big saves in this game. A lot of the goals he really just had no chance on specifically defensive zone breakdowns, turnovers, quick passing plays, especially on the game tying goal with four minutes left. That was just, you know, Flyers couldn't get the puck. And they really did have trouble getting the puck out of their own end today. And especially on the face-offs, which I brought up in the past recap as well, you know, they got to start winning more face-offs. And right now, in certain situations, especially on power plays too, they're not winning face-offs. If I look at the face-offs right here for today's game specifically, they only won 40% of the face-offs. And I can definitely tell you one that happened on that game tying goal. You have Katoria out there who just came out of the box for a fighting major. And there are a couple of fighting majors in a row, actually. Katoria went after one. And then Joel Farabee went after it with Corey Perry. So it was definitely getting crazy and really feisty as this game was getting into the dying minutes. But that face-off, you're, you're bringing in your best face-off man there. He doesn't win the face-off. Edmonton keeps the puck in the zone. You get a lot of shock blocks. You were blocking a lot of shots in this game. You blocked 21 of them, so you're taking a lot of them for the team, but when you're blocking those shots, it goes right back to the sticks of Edmonton, and you can't clear the puck out of the zone, and then a guy's out of position because he was blocking the shot, and then you got Evan Bouchard back door on a nice nifty passing play from Connor McDavid, and eventually McDavid was going to do something. He was not going to be held off the scoreboard Poured, you know, the entire night because that Ed, Connor McDavid just too good to do that to not basically score a point in a game. And you know, Edmonton, this was going to be a tough game in general. Edmonton was very desperate, very, very desperate. They lost all first, the first three of their games. I believe they only scored two goals in those three games. So offensively, they were in a major rut and they just didn't look the same. And this was a chance to really take advantage of that, especially when you go up in a 2 nothing lead. But, you know, Edmonton eventually found their juice. They tie the game up, but then you get that goal 
at the end of the second period, Bobby Brink shoots one in off of one of the Edmonton defenders. You originally think it's Chet Luchenko that scores that goal, and we're like, oh my god, all the Flyers rookies are scored, but nope, it goes off of one of the Edmonton defenders, and Bobby Brink gets credited with the goal. So... Then basically, I think for the third period, there were definitely a lot of good shifts defensively where you were able to clear the puck, but then it just got to those situations, especially in those final few, where you just, just defensive breakdowns and you couldn't clear the zone. And then eventually you force overtime. But then that also doesn't come to the past where you have a lot of chances in this game, five on five to, you know, not some goals in there. I think Brink had a, you know, a chance. I believe it was in the second period where he tried to roof one and they completely missed the net. Connect me. I thought he had a terrible game passing wise. He was just turning the puck over left and right. I think he just had a terrible game in general, especially when you go towards that final goal there in overtime by Edmonton. We'll get to that in a little bit there. Tippett had so many chances in this game, too many chances for him to not score. One of those was put like a nifty play where he was putting the, you know, basically breaking one of the defender's ankles on Edmonton. And he was, you know, just putting the puck between his legs, finding room, and then he just find a way to rot wire one. It goes off the goddamn post and off the back of Skinner, but he still manages to make the save there. I'm like, Tippett, you got to find a way to tuck one home, buddy. Like, it, it was going to that point where I was like, okay, he's got to figure out a way to tuck one in tonight, right? He's getting too many chances for him to not. But sadly, that wasn't the case. So the Flyers definitely did have a lot of chances five on five. I believe, you know, Scott Lawton had a shorthanded chance where they couldn't score on in that first period. So there were a lot of chances that the Flyers, you know, let this, you know, go away from them. And that really took away from them really winning this game. And like I said, I'm not going to really harp on them just because of the stretch that they're on right here to start the season four game road trip on the West Coast. It's definitely going to be, it's very difficult there. And if you're talking about getting three points in your first three games on the West Coast, I guess that's, you know, not the best possible outcome, but it's just like, it's respectable at the end of the day. But when I look at this, you blow a two goal lead, you blew a three, two lead with four minutes left, and then you completely broke down in the overtime, which should have been a penalty on Edmonton on the Sandheim breakaway gets completely knocked down when he's driving the net, and then Edmonton goes the other way. Erickson makes the save thanks with, you know, a little bit of help from the post on a Connor McDavid breakaway, but Travis Konechny just completely I don't know what he's doing defensively on this play. He's just tracking McDavid the entire time, just following him to the boards, where maybe he should stay in front of the net, try to, you know, get a puck if Erickson does make the save to where you could start a break, you know, a breakout the other way. Because Mitchkoff was out there too, and I think he was trailing just in case that was the possible chance of happening because all three Edmonton players moved up on the play. If Konechny gets that puck, if he knows where the puck is because he follows McDavid to the boards, the puck goes off the post, back into the corner, goes off of Konechny's skates, and right into the slot where Dryasaitl just cleans up the garbage and Harrison has no chance on it. So it's just like, what are you doing there, man? And Konechny was barking to the ref saying that you should have called a penalty there on the Sandheim play. And yes, it definitely should have been a penalty. But it's to the matter of the fact that just lackadaisical there. Just kind of stupidity, in my honest opinion. Because if you're in the right position, you get the puck. You send it the other way. It's a possible 2-1-1, 2-1-0 for whoever's on the ice at that point. Most likely Mitchkoff and Sandheim, unless someone got off the ice for Sandheim. So that that just, it, it needs to be better. It definitely needs to be better, and it will get better as the season goes along. I definitely don't, you know, think that's not going to happen. But there are some things that I am going to nitpick defensively. Like I said, too many defensive breakdowns. The wrist align and pair with Zamula has not been good. If I look at those two specifically, wrist align was a minus one today. Zamula, he was a plus. But I think overall, the start this season, Zamula has not been looking the sharpest. He's a minus four to start the year, and Rasmus Ristolainen, he is a minus one to start the year. So Ristolainen definitely isn't the worst of that pairing, but Zamula has not been good whatsoever. Definitely has not been. Cam York was a minus two. Sanheim was a minus three tonight. It was not a good night for Sanheim whatsoever. Because if you look at some of those analytic sheets that show like the ice tilt, I guess, between certain players and how they impacted the game in a negative or a positive way, Sanheim and Cam York were completely down there on the list. They did not have a good game whatsoever. You know, Mitch Goff gets two points on the two goals. Morgan Frost gets two assists on both of those Mitch Goff goals. Bobby Brink gets the, the goal. 
Konechny with an assist, Tippett with an assist, Joel Faraby with an assist. But look at some of the minuses on the ice. Konechny was a minus two, Tippett was a minus one, Couturier was a minus one, and your fourth line two out there was a minus one at the same time. I also do want to see anything from John Tortorella post game, but um, there's also something that I'm going to nitpick here, and I'm not sure if many people are going to agree with me at this point at all. It's really going to the fact of Sean Couturier. He just does not look the same. He just does not look the same. And he was never the fastest guy on the ice, but he just looks slow. Even his reads and, like, you know, trying to make plays happen, he just looks a little too slow for my liking. I don't know if that improves as the season goes along or it's just the toll, the injuries that he's been having over the, you know, so many seasons now to where even though, yeah, he this is finally his first full season coming in healthy, but even he had to do a deal with some off-season surgery stuff, so is even fully 100%, I have no idea, he just doesn't look the same, just does not, and that is definitely going to be a problem for the Flyers with his contract, and this, and like I said, I don't hate Couturier, I don't, I love Couturier, but it's just the fact that he just doesn't look like the same selkie type offense, guy that can, you know, chip into the offense type of player anymore, he just doesn't look like that, he's kind of more pinned in on the third line at these days at this point. And yeah, the lack of a first line center is definitely hurting this team. Right now, Matt uh, Morgan Frost is your best center because he could produce offensively with Matt Vaymichkov. And yes, it definitely helps on the power play too. Jet Luchenko in this game had some bad moments, had some good moments, didn't really stand out that much. I actually do want to see his ice time today for Luchenko. He played 17 minutes, so he played a good chunk of the game. So that's definitely interesting in that fact. Connecting had so much ice time today. He had 24 minutes. I don't think Connecting had a good game whatsoever. Forster played a lot of time. Forster has been very good defensively. He's been really shaping out that game a lot there, and that's really, really impressive there, especially when he can chip into the offense and score some goals. So that is definitely something that's really good going forward, especially with the way that Forster has been developing defensively. Now, if he can just get more consistent on his offensive game, that is going to be a really good weapon for the Flyers going into the future at this point because Forrester can be a really good player if he can find a way to fully mesh out his scoring capabilities with his defensive play because he makes some good stick reads, he makes some good body contact, he can find a way to force turnovers, basically make people uncomfortable in the defensive zone, just really good reads. He just knows where to be in the right positions at all times. And maybe that's help from John Tortorella. Maybe that's just the way Tyson Forrester has always played. But there's definitely some good things right there. I do want to really see if there's anything from John Tortorella postgame just to see what um is really happening here. But also, if I look at some of the ice time here, specifically, you know, Jet Luchenko had 17 minutes of ice time. Sean Couturier had nine. Sean Couturier didn't even surpass 10 minutes of ice time, and that probably also is granted because he was off the ice for five minutes with the fighting major, but Coots is really not being used out there at all by uh, John Tortorella, and I do actually want to see some of that ice time in the previous games too. There is a pattern there with Sean Couturier in the ice time, so if I go back to the Calgary game, and if I go back to the Vancouver games just to see the ice time totals there for the Flyers, so if I go to Sean Couturier, in the Vancouver game, he had 15 minutes. And in the Calgary game, he had 13 minutes. So his ice time has gone down in those past two games. So it might be something to monitor, might be something to monitor. But um, there definitely is something there. Who knows? I'm not sure if there's anything to point out there. But uh, yeah, there's definitely some intrigue right there. But uh, yeah, it's... uh. Definitely one that you did not want to let slip. And the Flyers definitely let that game slip. So, first three games so far, you get three of, of a possible six points, which could have been four of a possible six points if you won today's game. Um, overall, Matt Faye, Mitch Koff, look, there's a lot of positives to take away from this. Don't get me wrong. There definitely is plenty, 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 plenty of positives. I'm not going to really harp on this team whatsoever, but... And it's it's like I said, this is a very tough you know schedule to start off with at the beginning of the season, going out the West Coast for four straight games, and especially when you start the season not playing in over a week and a half, basically, from your last preseason game. Because you also got to handle the last preseason game the Flyers played, I believe it was the Thursday, the week before the, the opener against Vancouver. Uh, barely anyone played that game. It was mainly AHLers. 
So you're realistically talking about a week and a half of the regulars not playing hockey, even though that re really doesn't affect going into the Calgary game, going into this game against Edmonton. It's really just like, it's a very tough stretch because now you're going through that long stretch of not playing. you got to travel to the West Coast, adjust to the time zones, and now you're playing these games against Vancouver, a good team, you know, a gutsy team, feisty team in the Calgary Flames, and now a very desperate Edmonton Oilers team that has gotten off to a terrible start, and it was going to be a tough game regardless. So if you can find a way to win in Seattle on Thursday, and that is four games, so if you can get five of a possible eight points there, I could definitely see this road trip as a major success. 100% right now, you're 1-1-1 one, one, and one to start the season, so if you can find a way to get to back to Philadelphia for the home opener, 2-1-1, one, and one, you get five of eight points, I, I consider that a really good road trip to start the year. I definitely do consider that. But, um, also, some things that I do want to note, they definitely need to find a way to start scoring consistently 5-on-5 five five because the patterns that I'm seeing, so, so far, they have four power play goals on the air. So they scored two tonight, they scored the one in Calgary, and they scored the one in Vancouver. I believe they've scored a shorthanded goal. So that's one of those off the board in the goals that they have scored. So they scored two, they scored three goals tonight, three goals against Calgary, and technically two goals against Vancouver because the shootout goal doesn't count. So that's... Uh, eight goals to start the year, and four of those were on the power play. One of those was on the penalty kill, and three of those were five on five. So I think they just need to do a little bit better generating five on five chances. And Grant, like I said, that's going to improve as the season goes along. It 100% will. This is m really just me nitpicking and seeing things that are just like sticking out to me right now at, in these first three games. And like I said, a lot of things are very nitpicky. But, you know, three games right now, it's three games. And, yes, these games still do matter at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, you're still trying to figure out what this Flyers team is. And right now, you're going through a very tough stretch in Western Canada before you really start to get some sense of normalcy when you come back home. Then you go on some normal road trips, you know, that are not on the fucking West Coast for 50 straight games. So there's definitely a lot of things that you got to adjust to. And right now, I guess you could say getting three of a possible six points in the first three games right now isn't the worst thing in the world. It definitely isn't whatsoever. It would be nice getting that fourth point there to get four points in six games, but I guess I digress. <laughs> I guess I digress. Like I said, it definitely sucks because you blow a two-goal lead, you blow a three-two lead with four minutes left, and you just got to be better. Got to be better. Got to be better there whatsoever. I also kind of don't like the three-on-three -three setup, in my personal opinion. So the way the overtime started, they took they put Katoria out there to win the faceoff. Edmonton won the faceoff. They brought it back into their own zone. It allowed Katoria to get off the ice for Mitchkoff. So it was Konechny, Mitchkoff, and Travis Sanheim out there. Uh, I would like a little more speed out there, especially because Edmonton was throwing McDavid and Dreisaitl out there. I just kind of think that when you have Travis Sanheim out there, maybe the speed isn't the best, even though Sanheim had the chance driving the net. But um, maybe you put Drysdale out there, put a little more speed on the ice. Maybe something would have different happened. I have no idea. But it's just things that I'm pointing out right here that I'm trying to think. You know what I mean? Uh, let's see. So if I look at, you know, this comes from hockey stat cards. So this basically looks like right now, like what players had a better impact on the game and a worse impact on the game. So the Flyers that had a really good impact on the game. Mitch Koff obviously had a really good impact on the game. He was the Flyers' best player. Morgan Frost was the second best. Eric Johnson, that's shocking. He was the third best flyer on the ice. Tyson Forrester was there. Jamie Drysdale had a good game. Apparently it said Zamula had a good game on here. Konechny was kind of split down the middle, it says. Owen Tippett, more positive than negative. Bobby Brink, positive on the offensive side, negative on the defensive side, which is obvious. Jet Luchenko, Really, you know, not that big of an impact. He had some positive on-ice moments offensively. Had it, like, maybe minuscule moments defensively. Scott Lawton wasn't good. He was more of a negative impact. Joel Faraby was more of a negative impact, especially defensively. Same thing with Garnett Hathaway, Ryan Paling, Rasmus Ristolainen, uh, Sean Couturier, Travis Sanham, and Cam York. Those, those, that pairing was terrible tonight. They were just getting revved up there. And it's not to say that the York and the Scanheim pairing is terrible. It's not whatsoever. It's just that it really makes the difference between a top pairing in this league and more of what I consider Sanheim and York to be like a, you know, a traditional second pairing on an NHL roster. So I guess that just got exposed tonight. So like I said, it's not the fully end of the world. 
the team definitely will improve as the um, season goes along. kind of wish there was some showcasing of quotes from John Tortorella. I'm not sure if um, the Flyers' Twitter has posted anything here. It doesn't really look like they're going to, especially considering it's so late at night. So even though by the time I post this, this will be in the morning, you know, around maybe like 10, you know, 9, 10 a.m. or something like that. That's what I'll post it here because obviously no one's watching this at 1.30 at night. So basically what I'm talking about is completely irrelevant. <laughs> My God. Uh, let's see. So I'm just trying to see anything else here that is popping up on the Twitterverse that can maybe stand out from this game over something right here. But really nothing major, I would say, in particular. Not really much. Uh, nope, I don't think there is anything here really much that stands out more on the Twitterverse. So that's basically it. I want to see if there's anything that stands out from like Charlie O'Connor from today's game. Not sure if there is. No, not really much. Not really much. I don't think it. it's either Torts hasn't really talked yet or there's anything else. So... Really haven't seen much there. So as we look at the rest of the schedule right now, just to see some upcoming games, obviously they finally finished this goddamn West Coast road trip Thursday with another damn 10 p.m. game in Seattle. And Seattle so far, the start of the year, if I am not mistaken, they are, I think they're 2-2 two and two or something like that. I don't think 2-2, two and two, maybe 2-1, 1-2 and one, one and two or something like that. They are two. They are. They are two and two. They played four games so far. This will be their fifth game already. Jesus Christ! So they're two and two. They are two and one on on the road, and they are zero oh and one at home. Who did they just beat? Actually, the uh, yeah, Kraken. Who did they just beat? Who did they just beat? Who did they just beat? Was it Nashville? I think I remember seeing Nashville on the scoreboard. Yeah, Jesus Christ! They won seven to three against the Nashville Predators. My God! So they beat Nashville seven to three. They got shut out by Dallas the other night. They beat Minnesota in a shootout, and then they lost the opener to St. Louis to start the year. So that's interesting. Uh, there's definitely some things that you can look at on Seattle's thing. And really, basically, right now, the person you look at, I guess, is their goaltending with Joey Decord, but they really split time between him and Philip Grubauer. So we'll see who starts against the Flyers. I would assume it's most likely going to be Joey Decord. But with the way they're looking like they're splitting the goaltending up, who knows, it could be Philip Grubauer. I have no idea at the end of the day. And for the rest of the schedule, just for the upcoming games, so they got Saturday, the home opener against the Vancouver Canucks. That'll be 7 o'clock. And then they got two days off here, Sunday and Monday, before they play the Washington Capitals at home on the 22nd, followed by another game against the Washington Capitals on the road. So, interesting stuff there. Then they play Minnesota at home on the 26th, Montreal at home on the 27th, so that's a home back-to-back. -back. Uh, the 29th, they're in Boston, and on Halloween, they're home against the Blues. So, that is the rest of the month of October there. So, so far, three points in your first three games, three of six points. Not the worst thing in the world if you want to look at where they fall in the standings. Flyers-wise, they have three points on the year, obviously. Islanders, they're tied with. Pittsburgh, they're 2-2 two two to start the year. Rangers, they're 2-0-1. And, and the New Jersey Devils, they are 4-2 to start the year. Other teams, the Capitals, they're 1-1. One one. Hurricanes, they're 1-1. One and, one. and the Blue Jackets are 1-2 to start the year, if that matters. And if anyone's standing watching at this point, which I don't think they are. <laughs> you really don't start watching the standings until around American Thanksgiving. So that's really when the uh, games really start to matter post that. So, um, yeah. Definitely a sour way to win the game, 100%. But there are still a lot of positives to take, no doubt. Definitely no doubt. No doubt at all. But um, definitely I would like them to not blow a 2 nothing lead and a 3-2 lead late in the game. <laughs> definitely would not like that. But uh, is what it is. Three games into the season. Matthew Mitchkov has arrived. And we're moving forward now. So that'll do it for... Today, everybody, I appreciate you all tuning in whenever you decide to. Like I said, those will be posted in like the early part of the morning, like around 9, 10 a.m. or something like that. So uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. Don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section down below. Don't forget to drop a like. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It does me a great deal of service. And also use the code TTP Sports. $20 off your first purchase at SeatGeek. Great deal. Do not pass it up. Appreciate you guys for tuning in. I'll see you next time.